What's up, Dragon Brood? So today we want to talk about individual decks. You know, in our Discord, which by the way, you can join our Discord. Uh, the link is down in the description below. One of the things that came up is somebody said, why don't I highlight different decks and talk about why they're good or bad and how to beat them? And that seems like a fun idea, so I figured I'm going to give this a go. And right now, I figured if we're going to have that discussion, there's definitely public enemy number one, which we like on this channel, Gruul. Right? So, the thing about the current Gruul decks, though, is they're not your traditional Gruul decks. They're able to draw cards, they have a long game, they're not just trying to bash you in the face. And I think that's a thing that people get wrong when trying to battle them. So let's just start talking about why the Gruul decks are actually good. At its core, it's the adventure package, right? You normally have Innkeeper, Lovestruck Beast, and Bonecrusher Giant. Now, some decks will be playing some number of other things, sometimes Rimrock Knights, you know, sometimes Beanstalk Giants, one or two ofs, like, there's, there's some odd things that people play at times, but you normally have those core three cards. And those actually pull a lot of weight in the deck. Partly because the Innkeeper allows the opponent to have another type of card, or 1-1, one, one, that allows them to fight with their Lovestruck Beast. You also get Bonecrusher Giants, which doubles as removal, and then possibly draws a card on a later turn, in addition to being a 4-3 that damages you if you try to kill it. Right? So these are just good cards in general. This comes all the way back to when we had the Lucky Clover still legal and standard, right? Everybody kept saying, these adventure cards are already good. They're two for ones and then some, and then you're trying to make them three for ones or four for ones, right? That's not really what we should be doing. So good thing Clover's gone. But that doesn't change the fact that we still have to deal with the other cards that exist. Not that that's a bad thing, just saying these are cards we have to target. Now, the other big cards in the deck really are Great Hinge, which allows the opponents to draw several cards off of their creatures, and Embercleave. Now, some decks are playing both. Some are playing one of each. Some, you know, some are going like three deep and one up, like whatever. But you're normally gonna see each of those in these lists. They're also playing a good amount of removal. Now, the removal package seems to change from time to time. We've already talked about the stomp on the bone crusher giant but there's still going to be primal mites some are playing some amount of scorching dragon fires because those work well against the mardu i mean the rakdos midrange list and we're even seeing some that are finding finding other ways to play like fire prophecy or things like that one of the other benefits to the gruel deck is that they get to use the spell lands or your modal double face lands and that's nothing to turn your nose up at you know, they got a nice benefit that they basically got the best one of the modal double face cards, arguably, in Shatter Skull Smashing. They also got probably the best landfall creature in the set in the Mammoth. So both of those help a lot. It also allows the deck to possibly skimp on a couple of lands here or there to actually have a spell in those spots which allows the deck to go a little bit further in the long game and not necessarily stall out because they have more live cards. That's a very big benefit to this type of list. And also, let's not forget that a lot of these decks have started to adopt Vivian, Monster's Advocate. That's a powerful card in the late stages of the game. It works well in an environment where you have a bunch of rogues because you can produce three threes that have reach. It allows you to play creatures off the top of your library. Or, even later in the game, you can play a creature, search up a creature. You know, maybe play Lovestruck Beast and go find a Scavenging Ooze late in the game. You know, something like that is actually a pretty powerful play that Vivian gives you access to. Also, any of you that follow my channel will know that I've mentioned a few times in the last month to six weeks that we should all be playing more escape cards. There's so many mill options and rogues that are trying to put cards in your graveyard that having escape cards really gives you a bit of an advantage a lot of times. And Gruul gets to play some of the best ones. Where you're talking about the Phoenix or even just the Arachnid, though I'd probably sideboard that more than play it main. It still makes a big difference. And then some have even started playing Ox of Agonis. 
So there's a lot of quality choices here that can help them extend their game into the late game and still give them some defense as well as offense. The deck also is able to play lots of versatile cards in the main deck, whether that's Stone Coil Serpent, Clothis, or even something like Gem Razor. Like this gives this deck a lot of different flexibility to be able to attack different decks across the format and not necessarily have glaring weaknesses against any particular one deck. Now, all that being said, sounds like a hell of a deck list and a little bit of a world beater. <laughs> and in some ways it kind of is. It's public enemy number one right now for a good reason. It has a lot of versatility, a lot of flexibility. You can customize it to your needs. It even lets you keep up with the metagame to some extent without having to make any major changes to the deck list. So how do we go about attacking and beating something like this? Well, you know, I think the trick isn't trying to figure out how to beat Gruul itself. It's just figuring out how to deal with the Gruul decks and also not allow yourself to be too weak to other decks. For example, if you were to overload on removal, then the slower mid rangey control decks have a big advantage over you. Or maybe you're worried about fighting big creatures on the ground and tying up the ground space, but then you get beat by rogues with their flyers, right? So you need to find some in-between space that works very well. Now let's talk about mid-range and control options. This is something you can definitely do and we're seeing it more in the current metagame, especially with decks like Doom Foretold or the variety of blink decks that we're seeing that utilize Yorian. And this makes a lot of sense, right? The Yorian decks are playing lots of stuff like Glass Caskets and the Skyclave Apparition. And this allows you to remove those early creatures from Ghoul while they're trying to build up a board and keep things at parity so you can keep pace with them. And then if you get a Yorian, sometimes you get to swap out those different cards. You know, you blink your apparition again, just give them a small token. And that's not nothing. When you're talking about turning a 5-5 in the form of a Lovestruck Beast into a 3-3, well, that's a real thing. Also, Doom Foretold is not easy for the Gruul decks to deal with. They have a few answers if they main deck something like Gem Razor, but otherwise, it really shortens their window of opportunity. So if they get down to one or two creatures, they have to try to get it done in the next turn or maybe two turn cycles, or else they lose all their creatures and then they're on the back foot. But having actual removal just works as well. And a lot of the popular removal right now includes Heartless Act which pretty much works against everything in the Gruul list that we've seen, except for maybe if they're playing Stone Coil Serpent or if they're playing Scavenging Ooze. I think that's it. There's nothing else really in those lists that make tokens or make counters. Uh, the other thing too to think about here is there are a lot of times even where removing three counters off of a Scavenging Ooze can be enough to allow you to kill it or make the creature small enough so during combat you can still block it. Now, Scavenging Ooze is a whole different problem, but Scavenging Ooze and, to that extent, Stone Coil Serpent also die to Blood Chief's Thirst, which is the other most popular removal in the format. So as they're playing those, that does give you a bit of a leg up, so it's not like you're without answers if you're playing Black. People have also discovered that a Crowan War works very well against the Gruul list. And it works so well to the point that you've seen a lot of Gruul lists stop playing Questing Beast main deck. And I kind of get it. I mean, if your opponent were to steal your questing beast with the Akroan War, well, they're going to get to attack with it. And then you now have to deal with your own thing that has death touch. And that's not where you want to be, really. Now, the other thing you can do to battle Gruul is actually go big. They don't have all that many spells that can deal with big creatures, usually just something like Primal Might. So if you're playing things that are for toughness or larger, they actually almost have to start trading you creatures one for one or using some kind of two-for-one removal to get rid of it. Because again, coming back to them playing stuff like Scorching Dragonfire, maybe Fire Prophecy or something in that space, they're not able to get rid of the big creatures. So you're seeing some of the teamer ramp decks have some success right now. I mean, we might as well call it what it is because they're able to keep pace in those early turns, then start hitting their own big four toughness creatures like Terror of the Peaks or even big Beanstalk Giants. That makes it really hard for the Gruul deck to punch through. And let's also talk about 
how do you deal with the elephant in the room in the form of Embercleave? That seems to be a card that so many people are afraid of. And, you know, if you watch any of my videos, there's times I'm like, well, yeah, if my opponent has Embercleave here, I guess that's it. But one of the things you can do a lot of the time is manage the creatures that are on the board. If you leave them with just one, two, or three toughness creatures, that's kind of okay if they have an Embercleave, because you can normally block to a point where you might take one or two trample damage, but you kill the creature that's equipped with the Embercleave. Or do something to where you're killing the one one so they can't ever attack with something like questing or love struck beast, sorry. And I think that makes a big difference there. A lot of times, like I said, coming down to dealing with Embercleave has nothing to do with the cleave itself as much as managing the board state. Or create situations where your opponent has to put a cleave in spots they don't necessarily want to to gain an advantage, or maybe they trade the one big hit from the cleave to let you kill off their other small creatures, and then you have less to worry about on the coming turns. Also, here's another small tip. I've watched some people make this mistake, but unless you're lower on life or you're afraid maybe the Ember Cleave is going to get you for some reason, you probably want to just get rid of the Innkeeper. The Innkeeper is going to result in so many extra cards that you don't necessarily want to let that sit on the table. A lot of times, an Innkeeper just drawing two extra cards is going to be enough to make a difference in the game because the margins are so close for the Gruul decks. Though, now that I've said that, also keep in mind, one of the things you need to keep track of is the reduction in cost on a Great Hinge. Because the Great Hinge is the other way that the Gruul decks are really going to be able to go the long game and just kill you with Karn Advantage. I would argue that the Great Hinge might even just be outright better than the Innkeeper and scarier. So when your opponent has something like a Lovestruck Beast sitting on the table, there's a good chance that you probably have to start considering, okay, how many cards does my opponent have in hand? What if one of those is... A great hinge and the other one's a creature can i handle this or survive the next turn or two if not sometimes you have to go ahead and make that decision to get rid of the love struck beast even when you don't want to just to keep that great hinge off the board for just one or two more turns while you buy time to set yourself up to not get crushed by the card advantage your opponent would be receiving from the great hinge i'll also say that there's the option of doing things like the rakdos mid-range decks are doing with stuff like Mire Tritons, where that keeps your opponent from wanting to attack with their big creatures. You can also sideboard in things like Nighthawk Scavenger. That's another option. It gives you a Death Touch creature that you can take down their big things. And then if you end up in a stalemated situation, then you can start attacking for most likely four to five damage over the top, and you're gaining life in the process. A lot of times people look at something like the scavenger and say like, well, why would I play it? I don't have a way to put a bunch of cards in my opponent's graveyard, but your opponent's going to be doing that anyway, trying to deal with your other stuff. You know, whether it's a Scorching Dragonfire to kill something, or maybe you blocking a creature of theirs and sending something to the graveyard that way, you're still going to have a three or maybe even a four power scavenger, and sometimes that's enough. So in general, is Gruul Adventures that good? Well. Yeah, it is. Is it beatable? Absolutely. I would think if you really look at this past weekend's results, which you can see in MTG Melee, you can look up their recent deck finish or tournament finishes, and then you can click on those and see the individual decks and even see what decks each of those players beat with their top finishing list. And what you'll notice is you're starting to see fewer Gruel Adventure decks converting. Now you still are seeing one or two in just about all the top eights, but for the number of times you're seeing that deck, especially sometimes when you're talking up to 30% of some of these fields could be Gruul Adventures or Gruul Aggro, depending how they choose to classify it, you're not necessarily seeing three or four Gruul decks in every top eight. And that says a lot. That means people are finding ways to combat it. Yes, there is some attrition of their own fighting each other and knocking each other out, but you are finding answers, so it's not without hope. It's just a really strong deck. And, you know, we're not even done yet. We've seen a lot of innovation over the last couple of weeks as people have started to really tweak and really mess around with this format a bit and find other answers. And I think there's still more to come. So hopefully these tips help you out. Hopefully if you're playing Gruul, you know what people are going to be looking to do to you now. Or maybe you're just looking for the next step of evolution of the format. Either way, hope it helps. If there's any other ideas or thoughts or cards you should be playing or ways that you're having success battling Gruul, let me know down in the comments below. 
And if you haven't, please remember to like this video, hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and help me out while we're having a hard time getting YouTube to pay us. Because, you know, I have another video about that too if you want to know the details. But that's all I have for you for now. We'll see you next time.